Welcome everyone. Uh, today's webinar is titled Strategies for Managing Leaf Diseases, Reducing Your Stress While Keeping Predictable Control. Today is Thursday, January 27th. It is the second webinar of our webinar series for 2022. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, I hope you were able to join us on Tuesday for Dr. Hodel's uh, presentation on palms and palm issues. I know I personally learned a lot. I'm not terribly familiar with palms. Um, and if you'd like to maybe watch that, uh, uh, get some really great information on uh, banana moth and fusarium wilt and palm, palm biology, by all means, go check out our website. Uh, we do uh, provide those uh, uh, for free so you can watch those and learn them. You won't be able to get CEUs for those after the fact, but uh, certainly the learning is uh, worth it in and of itself. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, for those of you that maybe have not utilized Zoom before, there's two buttons um, on your, on your slide, uh, slider for your control panel. There's a chat feature and a question and answers uh, uh, tab. We do ask that you use the Q&A tab for asking questions. It's a little easier for, to make sure that we want make get your questions answered. Uh, we don't want to miss anything. And same thing if you want to throw your ISA, C, uh, ISA uh, certification number in there, by all means do so. Um, if you forgot to do it during registration or you just want to double check um, to make sure that we get that, just type that into the Q&A and we'll get that taken care of so we, uh, we can make sure you get your, your one ISA credit that is available for today. We are recording this and we will send out the link afterwards. Um, let me just double check. Yep, we do have this recording. So we'll be going that. And I do have Patrick Anderson on here as well. He's helping me out in the background to make sure that uh, questions are getting answered. Um, and uh, he'll certainly, if there's something that's uh, particularly relevant for the moment, um, he may uh, just shoot me a note that I might wanna answer that. But for the most part, questions we'll answer at the end. So thank you. And if you do have any, um, if there is any technical difficulties, um, whether you know technology does have issues, if my internet goes out or something like that, just bear with us and we'll jump uh, right back on and get this going. We do have some backup internet, but um, they do happen. So just uh, be patient with us. So with that, let's kind of dig in. Um, first thing I wanna make a, a note of is you may notice a different brand and a different logo. Um, Rainbow Scientific Advancements is now Rainbow Eco Science. We made this change on November 20 or November 1st of last year. Um, it's the same great company, um, the same great people, um, just a new name. And it really reflects uh, our company's purpose that we started in arboriculture with working with trees primarily. But now as we work with the entire green industry, um, this just represents kind of what we're doing. And also just for the, the sake of Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements is a mouthful to say um, and to, to put on a business card and to have on logoed shirts. So just uh, that, but uh, we weren't bought out. Um, still the same great company, um, same everything, um, same great products, same great service. So with that, quick safety brief. Um, if you are driving, uh, please do make sure that you're doing, uh, you're listening in hands-free or um, pull off to the side of the road. Um, check the weather forecast, um, especially for any inclement weather, whether there's a potential for severe weather or snowstorms or extreme cold. Um, in Minnesota, where I am currently, it's a beautiful 31 degrees, so a full 50 to 60 degrees warmer than it was two days ago. So we're doing just fine. And uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Chris Haugen. I am the Assistant Director of Sales, um, but my background is, is from primarily hands-on from the field. Um, I was a, a professional practicing arborist for uh, 15 years, and then I've been on the, the, the plant healthcare support side for the last uh, about uh, seven or eight. So um, I'm coming at this, and this, is, is, this was a fun one for, this presentation was fun for me to kind of put together because it got me back thinking about, you know, the things I had to do out in the field and some of the questions I had coupled with some of the questions that our technical support staff, whether the arborologists or our territory managers have brought to us. So we wanted to make sure we put together some information that you can really take out into the field immediately uh, for your foliar spray season, which is 
coming up quite quickly. So what I'm gonna to cover today is a couple of things. It's really to leave with a foundational understanding of why foliar applications do what they do. Um, and I don't wanna step over a kind of understanding of why do we have foliar applications as a part of our toolbox, but also how do they do what they do? Because that does matter for where you're applying them, maybe what pesticide you're choosing to use, um, and also ensuring that you're getting it to the proper part of the plant that you're gonna either kill the insect that you're dealing with or put that protective barrier on there for a disease or maybe a rust. And then really know and understand and be able to manage the variables that you can control. Um, I'll repeat this a couple of times, control the things you can control. Um, foliar sprays, there's a lot of things that are out of your control, whether it's the weather, um, your customers, what their desires are, the neighbors of your customers, and even just, you know, just luck of the draw. But there are so many things that I see that are able to be controlled that can, when they're overlooked or missed, can cause a lot of downstream issues with getting proper control. So we're going to go through some of those of, you know, controlling what you can do or controlling what you can, and that requires preparation. And then I'll provide you some strategies to ensure your foliar sprays are as predictable and effective as possible. So obviously we aren't able to, you know, do a hands-on training, you know, in a webinar where we're going to go out and show you kind of what drift looks like. But I have some photos and some, some situational things that I'm going to walk through that give you a sense of how technicians can be trained to minimize those to ensure that you're getting the best results that you can. So the first thing I want to touch on is where do foliar sprays really fit in your toolbox? Foliar sprays, um, and when I say foliar sprays, most people, I think most commonly, they think about foliar fungicide sprays, you know, whether it's for apple scab or anthracnose, but expand that out to also whether you're doing mite sprays on your, your shrubs, or maybe it's insecticide sprays. Think about all those things that you're spraying into the air, whether, you know, it's a big tree spray, like, you know, we think of the old, um, the old, uh, uh, you know, elm sprays where we're, we're spraying, you know, 80 feet into the air, all the way down to if you're spot spraying um, some boxwoods for um, some mites. So just keep those in mind. And foliar sprays are a necessary part of our toolbox. Unfortunately, the, the science and the technology really doesn't um, lend itself to, you know, eliminating them from our toolbox. It has become definitely from what we're actually doing as a plant healthcare kind of in, you know, in, the, in our industry, foliar sprays were the primary tool and application that we had many, many years ago. But now with the, the ability to do bark sprays, soil applications, or basal trunk sprays, or tree injection, we have many more tools that we can add to that toolbox to reduce the number of foliar sprays. And foliar sprays are unfortunately very challenging to schedule. Um, I think probably all of you have 10 or 20 reasons why you don't want to do them. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to schedule them. The rain days, the equipment, the questions from customers and, and their neighbors of what do you spring? How toxic is it? So it's really, how do we minimize those to what we absolutely have to do? But we absolutely still need to have those in our toolbox. And we want to make sure that we're doing those in the most effective manner possible. So the first part I'll, I'll kind of put in here is let's talk about just, you know, I, I it's every, many of you are probably familiar with this, the disease triangle. I included insect in here, even though insects can have multiple hosts, um, um, but they're not as specific, but I, it, it, it brings, a point, brings the point very nicely of, we have kind of three things we can control there's, or parts that impact it. There's the environment, which we can have some impact on. Um, we can address, you know, maybe some of those abiotic issues um, like soil compaction, or is it properly watered, mulched, some of those things, or removing some of those, uh, uh, maybe the, the abscised leaves that have the, the disease on there, or maybe we're removing um, some plant material that's infected with an insect so that we have less of the reproduction. We can affect those but then we can also look at how are we helping out the host? 
um, whether we're addressing you know, its health um, or pruning out dead material, but then also the pathogen or the insect. And we want to make sure that if we're addressing those, that we're actually going to get those controlled. Um, and this comes into play, especially with if we're looking at when these insects or these diseases are present. What life stage are we uh, attacking and, and really protecting? Having that core understanding and getting really specific about when do I actually need to do my foliar sprays um, or when does this product need to be on there? And also what life stage are we uh, uh, checking? And I bring this up, especially with, uh, think of your insect issues. There's a lot of insect, insect issues, whether it's mites, caterpillars that we traditionally have, have sprayed and you've been waiting for, all right, we've got the larval stage. They're, they're small, they're feeding, let's get out there and get them. Consider maybe there's some products and we'll talk about like Lepitec where you might be able to do a soil application for some of your plant material to then reduce how much foliar spraying you're doing. But it does require that timing, but it gives you a wider window than a foliar spray. So to kind of bring this, let's look at apple scab specifically. So apple scab, and I picked apple scab simply because it pretty much covers no matter where you are in the United States or uh, abroad, it's, it's, a, it's a disease that's kind of common to everyone, but think about it as just a standard leaf disease. This is a leaf, uh, a disease that it infects early in the spring. So right when we start seeing the leaves develop right from that bud stage, um, we call it the mouse ear stage when the leaves are just about the size of your, your thumb, that's when that disease is really ramping up. When you've got some of these spores that are coming in from the trees next door that all the infected leaves from last year they're releasing their canidia spores. And those, those are just different stages of the, the fungal spore itself. But what they do is they land on the surface of the leaf, they infect the tissue, and then they're feeding off of the nutrients in the, the parts of the plant to then reproduce themselves. And then it creates these scab appearing uh, lesions on the, on the leaf tissue and the, and the fruit. What we're trying to do in this is interrupt this cycle by putting basically a prophylactic or a, a covering on it so that the, the spores aren't able to actually penetrate into the leaf to then reproduce. And this is a, a, a really important part because it's timing specific and it's environmentally specific. It requires um, the, the temperatures and the moisture. If there's a reason why in Denver in particular, Foliar leaf diseases just aren't as big of a deal. Um, it's not as humid. You don't have the, the, the foliar or the spring weather that is propelling uh, apple scab. It's not to say that you don't have that at all, but it's just less common than maybe in um, the Southeastern United States. So we're gonna look at kind of how would we maybe attack this or reduce it? So. The first thing to understand is what are we trying to do with our foliar spray? So I'll talk about, you know, we talked about apple scab and its life cycle, but the first thing is controlling the pathogen of the insect. We have to understand how is it that the pathogen of the insect is actually in, infecting our, our plant? Are they chewing on the leaf tissue or the woody tissue? Are they inserting a stylet like an aphid or a scale insect where they're sipping on that xylem tissue? or in the case of a foliar leaf disease, we have our leaf. My beautiful representation of a leaf here is this green box. So what the, the spore wants to do is land on there and then, this is my beautiful spore. It lands on there and what it's gonna do is basically start growing and developing on that leaf surface. But what it really also needs is, it needs a little bit of water, it needs some moisture. So think about in the spring when you have um, some dew, maybe some fog and the bright temperature conditions, that just allows this spore to really just progress. It's developed over time and evolved to just love these conditions because it's quite prevalent. What we're trying to do is interrupt this. So what we're gonna do is this is our first spray. So we're gonna talk about a couple of fungicides that are very common and that I do recommend for apple scab. But what it's basically doing is putting a coating we are trying to coat the surface of the leaf so that that spore, and you'll see my beautiful spores that come in later, they're not able to actually penetrate onto that, into that leaf surface to then take out, suck out the nutrients and grow on that growing medium. It's a prophylactic, but over time, this foliar spray, whether it's due to UV degradation or sunlight, 
breaks down that, that fungicide or the half-life of the fungicide breaks down, we have to reapply. We need to put another layer on there to keep this uh, from, from breaking down. But also think about a leaf in the spring. It's growing. It's When we're putting down our first spray, it's about the size of a thumbnail or maybe a little smaller than that, about the mouse ear stage. Many fungicides don't stretch very well. Kind of they, where you put them and where they're in contact is where they kind of stay. So as that, that leaf grows, there's more surface area to cover. So we've got to put that second spray on. And then finally, we'll have continued attempts of infection as we grow through the spring, but then we'll have more, we'll put on that third spray. And in some cases, in some parts of the country, you might need four. But what's important to note is that the timing of your first spray is really, really important. The first spray is the most important one. We wanna make sure that we're getting that fungicide on there first and early before that, that fungal spore. Because if we miss that, we can have some levels of infection already before we get our first spray on there. And if you put on a fungicide that doesn't have any curative or therapeutic effect, we're not gonna have control. That, that pathogen is gonna continue to grow despite having a, 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 a different fungicide that's maybe just a, an initial contact one on there. So what you choose does really matter. And then look at also, um, we talked about foliar sprays provide immediate control of populations. Um, we need it there exactly there. We can't put a fungicide on um, before the leaves are there. Um, we can't put a fungicide on uh, when the, the, the leaf tissue hasn't developed because they don't, there isn't a systemic option for it. And then we need to really focus on what insects are only controlled via contact materials, or maybe the systemic controls aren't as effective. We need to be really aware of those in your territory. And then also most foliar leaf diseases are only controlled with foliar sprays. Um, there are some things you can do around on the margins, um, you know, with, with apple scab, there's, um, you can use camostat or a PGR to reduce the incidence or allow the plant to tolerate it, but it's really not controlling the disease. The plant may look healthier and reduce how the leaf drop later on, but it's not replacing a foliar spray program. You may use it in areas where sprays just aren't feasible. But it's important to note that the expectations are not the same as a foliar spray program. Um, you can do some things with uh, soil nutrition that the plant tolerates it. But if you have a lot of disease pressure or some of the rust issues, you need to have a prophylactic spray on there. So it's really honing in on what do you absolutely need to utilize for a foliar spray versus maybe there's some other options. And I bring up specifically mite, uh, spider mites here and aphids. These are pests that I, I very frequently see um, customers doing a foliar spray for when they're doing an IPM program. Um, some of it is because, well, you know, they're present when I'm doing my foliar spray fungicides. And what I kind of want to make the point of, and I'll make it here, is the first strategy is to reduce your total number of foliar sprays. If you look at what you have going on in the spring, and a lot of when this pest activity occurs, they kind of happen together. But what if you're able to, and I'm just gonna make an example. Let's just say your company has 500 foliar sprays that you have to do. And this is including your first round, second round, third round, fourth round, your aphid sprays, your boxwood sprays from mites, all of those things. If you total all those up, that's a lot of man hours that you have to put into just doing those sprays. And when you have more labor hours that you have to do these, the more likely you are to have days where there's rain, where there's wind, where the customer's windows are open, there's a car underneath it, all these things that make it harder to do a foliar spray. So then you might end up with, well, I had 500 sprays to just do what was, was um, what the accepted work is, but due to resprays from you know cars being there, all these other things, you might end up having 550 sprays to do. So really look at what you're bidding out and start looking at what pests and what insects can I look at maybe reducing or not doing a foliar spray. You might have to do a second visit um, or a visit before that pest is there, but if you're not relying on a foliar spray, maybe you can do a soil application or a systemic application in some of these instances. You're going to have fewer sprays to do so that you can really focus on, like I said, the ones that you really only have one opportunity to do it. 
um, such as Apple Scab in particular. So I kind of put together a, just a kind of a quick little thing, um, and this is to kind of make the point of look at your healthcare operations and prioritize. So on the left, we have Apple Scab, Rhizosphera, Aerophyid mites, and some of the leaf rust. These are operations that are very time sensitive. Um, with Apple Scab, you have to get that full that spray on as best you can, right when that initial bud, when you get bud break and you've got that first set of leaves coming out. Rhizosphera, once that initial candle, which for those maybe if you don't deal with spruce trees, Rhizosphere is a brutal, brutal uh, needle cast disease that occurs in the upper Midwest. But you only get one opportunity really to start those. So if you're reducing some of these sprays, because oftentimes spider mite control, aphids, white fly, um, and some of these caterpillars in their early instars, they can also coincide with when you would do these sprays. So if we're looking at the, the right side of the slide, all of these have an option that you don't need to foliar spray. Um, and I threw tree growth regulation in there because most people don't do camastat or tree growth regulation. Um, um, you know, nobody does that as foliar spray or soil nutrition. But these are unfortunately, I see people doing these applications um, in the same time frame that they would be doing a foliar spray for apple scab. And some of it's driven by, well, I'm making a good route. Um, I'm going to go to this property and I don't want to make two stops. So I'm going to spend half of, you know, maybe a half day doing so, uh, soil nutrition when it's a beautiful spray day. I'm trying to coach to reduce the number of operations that complicate a good spray day. Um, even if you've got to come back twice, it might be worthwhile. And I'm not saying this is a hard and fast rule that never do this. If you've got a property 40 miles from everything else, yeah, you might want to do that soil nutrition at the same time, but you may not want to do it on the first visit. Do it on the third spray or the second spray when you have more time. So really look at what can you take and do at a different time, maybe do it beforehand. Like um, I'll just talk spider mites, for example. Uh, with spider mites, for example, you have a couple of different options. Um, leverage is systemic. Maybe you want to do in the early spring, do a Lepitec soil application for some of these these spider mite issues. Um, with some of these cool ones, you can do this maybe about 20 day, 10 to 15 days before you start seeing them because it is fairly predictable. You can use your growing degree days and get a pretty good sense when you're going to have a mite uh, infestation. Get out ahead of them and give you rapid control with a residual of 30 to 40 day, 45 days. This means you don't have to do a foliar spray for it, even though foliar sprays absolutely work really well. But then it's also product choice. Um, the first thing is use a use a miticide, and I'm 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 kind of using mites as the example here. But um, I've I've seen frequently. Um, well, I have some bifenthrin, or I have some permethrin, or I have some porta on the truck. I'm just going to use that as a as a miticide because why not? You know, it it does work to some degree. But when you have many other options available for a a, a better miticide that has a, uh, um, a, a reapplication window of 28 days, that's a much better uh, ability to get something on at the right time when you have 28 days, basically a month to get back there versus a 14 day window. Because then you can eliminate a whole spray that you're not trying to fit in when it's raining or windy. So look at the product choice that you're using. You might be able to stretch out instead of doing two or three sprays in the spring, maybe you have to do one or maybe you can just do a soil application. So that you're trying to target ahead of the season. Um, and this is where the planning comes in. You wanna target ahead of the season, reducing how many foliar sprays you're doing. And then make every spray count. Use the most effective materials for the insect or the disease that you're trying to manage. Um, I kind of mentioned that with some of the miticides. Reach out to your vendor, reach out to your territory manager, your arborologist, if you have questions like, hey, should are there maybe different options that you're not aware of? Um, and then this is another one. Ensure your pesticides are mixed properly. Read the label and talk with your territory manager or your arborologist. There's a lot of great information on the label. Um, and I'll, I'll come, go through an example here shortly. Use surfactants and adjuvants. If you are doing a foliar spray, it is a standard practice to add in at minimum a spreader sticker. You will get far better efficacy and control with it 
and the products will just work better. You'll bet, get better control, you'll have more rain fast, and you need to read the label because you may need to adjust your water pH, or you might wanna put in a deposition agent where, so if you're spraying, it's not drifting as much. And then make your sprays count by getting the product on the target. So the first thing, read the label. And what you're kind of looking for is, well, to use the product safely, um, understand how the product works and how it's mixed, but also is this product the most effective for the pests? Labels have lots and lots of information on there, um, whether it's written for more of an ag use or a, a ornamental use, but what restrictions should I be aware of? And then what pest does this work on? And are there added benefits? So I'll kind of work through here. We're gonna look at specifically in this instance, apple scab. Apple scab is a very common leaf disease, as I mentioned, but also the label has two, and this is Microtech, which is a great product that I, I strongly urge you to, to utilize for apple scab. And the reason why I look at this, if you read the label here, it says, Microtech is a locally systemic fungicide having protectant and curative properties that will translocate to new growth. So there's a couple of parts to key in on here. There's locally systemic. So it means it goes from the top side of the leaf to the bottom and vice versa, and it'll move within the leaf tissue. So that's gonna allow you to get better coverage within the plant, and it has protectant and curative properties. So when we looked at that, that my beautiful leaf uh, example with the, the spores landing on it, this would mean that even if there's a couple of spores or a few that have landed on it prior to you getting to that property, you have a better chance of getting control on it because it's actually gonna kill that, 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 um, that spore. But then when we look at, well, what rate should I use? So we're looking here on the label and it's for use directions for landscape, greenhouse and nursery animals. So this covers pretty much what everybody here is on there. And it says, apply Microtech at the rate of six to 12 fluid ounces per 100 gallons. Okay, 100 gallons is a pretty standard, you know, spray tank mix, maybe it's 50 gallons. So we've got a window here of six to 12 ounces. So most of the time you'd be looking at for some of these um, um, fuller leaf diseases and a six to 12 ounce rate. But if we were to only read that more than likely, I, and I would recommend use the highest rate. Um, you wanna use the highest rates for high pressure uh, issues and, and, and solutions. But this is for non-fruit bearing trees. If we didn't read the label far enough, we would miss this part. And this is where, um, if you are using this on um, home orchards, vineyards, or fruit trees, which apple scab is a perfect example, it's got some more specific uses. Microtech's great for this because it does give you the, the ability for a homeowner to actually eat the fruit themselves, um, which a lot of homeowners really like. So what you're looking at here is the rates are a little different. They're not that six to 12. We would wanna be at this four to six range for, for, for 100 gallons. So we would probably, we would select this six fluid ounce rate for a, a 100 gallon tank. But it also gives you some, in, some ideas on application windows. When the green tip is favorable or in, infection period is, tip, is favorable. It gives you some guidance on that, but it also gives you, as you move through it in your final spray, if you were gonna be doing post-infection, so you knew you missed maybe your first spray, you would wanna use the highest rate. So it gives you some of these guidance on, it gives you that guidance of what you should be doing on there for the year and how, how to use it. So make sure you read the label. And if you have questions, reach out to us. We're happy to help you out with that. Another common product that I see um, for uh, foliar leaf diseases like apple scab is Cupro. Cupro 5000, which is a very old fungicide and it works very well, but the label is a little bit broader. It doesn't necessarily give uh, uh, landscape users all that much information of, well, what rate should I be using and how? Um, when we're looking at it, the mix rates are in per acre, which is great if you're an orchard, but if you're a, a, a tree care company or a shrub care company, not all that helpful. The rate TNO users should be using for most product or for most uses here is three pounds per hundred gallons. And you're gonna begin application at the first sign of disease and repeat at seven to 14 day intervals. But notice here that this does not have curative 
or ther therapeutic uses on here. So this is one that it doesn't stretch with the leaf. I mentioned as that leaf grows, this is one where it's really a contact uh, fungicide. It's got to be touching where you're trying to protect. It's putting that coating on there. And you would absolutely need to have these surfactant in here. But there's also a part that's in here that I think often gets missed. There's a pH part. Maybe it's on the first page. I apologize. It does have a pH, uh, pH guidance. Uh, oh, here it is, right at the top. Cupro 5000 should not be applied in a spray solution having pH of less than 6.5 as phytotoxicity may occur. If you don't know what the pH of your water is to start, you, know, you might be at below than 6.5, but you also, if you maybe thought, well, it's a little high, I'm gonna add in a buffer. Well, if you don't check to know how far down you've got it, you could be getting below 6.5 quite quickly. So these are things that you wanna add in here and the label will also have any mixing uh, guidance. Finally, uh, a quick note on mixing vessels, um, whether it's mixing cups, mi measuring jugs, make sure you're, you're noting whether you're mixing by weight, dry weight, or fluid volume. Um, I unfortunately can't tell you how often I've seen people using, um, and I mean, I would just pick on, you know, the safari cups because they're common. Those are in ounces. Those are weight ounces specific to safari, to that specific formulation. They are not a fluid ounce measuring cup. Um, make sure that you're using a, a measuring cup that's for fluids if you're using fluids and by weight, use a scale. But if you're mixing uh, two liquids together, mix the clear one first. A common one is um, propiconazole and thiophanate methyl um, or microtect and propiconazole or microtect and some other uh, material. Mix the one that's clear. Propiconazole is kind of a yellowish clear color. Mix that first and then mix in your white material that has more of like the pancake batter look to it so that you can actually see the volumes that you have in there. So when we're mixing pesticides, um, we wanna make sure we have water in the tank, measure out half your volume. And the label is gonna have guidance for mix with water, the pesticide and a surfactant to create your spray mix. Most labels will have this guidance, but what they're probably not going to have is um, making a tank mix. So if you're mixing two pesticides together, you probably will see this on herbicides for sure. Um, there's a lot of herbicides that recommend you know mix two or three together, but with most pesticides, they may have limited information of when you're making a tank mix. Um, you have to do a jar test. Um, some of them, it, it will maybe give some guidance of mix these first, um, especially some of those dry powders. But definitely make sure if you're going to make, make a mix with these that you do a jar test and you've done it before and you know what your pH is on these. And when you're making tank mix, um, this is part of also when I'm, when I'm trying to um, make your sprays count. Um, I generally don't recommend making a big, you know, kind of the, the big slurry batch where you've got a, mi a miticide, a fungicide, and an insecticide all together. You're going to waste product unnecessarily. You're going to hit a lot of non-target item, uh, plant material, or insects. But I do recommend if you're for resistance management for some of those rust issues, it isn't a bad idea to mix two fungicides together. Or if you're looking at some of your, your later uh, later, later rounds of some of your leaf diseases like apple scab, and maybe you're starting some of your fungicides uh, for uh, conifers, those two can have a common, they can have common fungicides that you'd use. So add those together, but don't make it as a standard practice. And this also encourages you to create routes for efficiency of what you're actually spraying for. And then also um, a common one though is a fungicide with a miticide in some cases. But if you are measure, uh, gonna do kind of a, a, a tank mix, follow these nine. This is the list of what you would mix them in order to. Um, so wettable powder all the way through uh, adjuvants and emulsified concentrates. Finally, I'll make a, a, a quick plug on adjuvants and surfactants. I said this before, if you are doing a foliar spray, you absolutely need to have a spreader sticker in the the, the spray mix. Um, a non-ionic surfactant like Audible will 
provide you immense benefit. It's going to give you rain fastness. It'll also give you better coverage. I'll, I'll show a little video here that'll give you some, some idea of what that looks like. Drift retardants and deposition agents. Um, I don't recommend them as a standard practice, but definitely if you're doing large tree sprays um, where you're going to be spraying more than say 40 or 50 feet or 40 feet in the air, I think it's probably a good idea. Um, you'll get better coverage on them. Anti foams um, definitely have those for a lot of a lot of fungicide mix and insecticide mix. They just especially if you have jet agitation, you may need those just to keep that foam down. And then pH buffer, depending on what your water source looks like, where it starts at, and what your pesticides need are. Herbicides in particular are very sensitive to pH. Um, so, but try to keep most of your, your fungicide and insecticides and miticides pretty much right around seven or at neutral. So here's an example. So you, we have our leaf here. And on our on the left side here, we have a, this is what a droplet would look like without a spreader sticker. They're gonna add a droplet of our fungicide equivalent with a spreader sticker, Audible 90. And you can see the difference in how it spreads out on the leaf. Whoop. As they put it on, watch how quickly it spreads out on, onto the leaf surface. It's breaking that surface tension and it's allowing much smaller droplets when they land on there to just spread out. So this is where spreader stickers give you better coverage. They'll attach to the leaf better, and they'll also give you more rain fast. Now, rain fast is something that's especially important in the spring when you're doing your foliar leaf disease. So always, 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 if you're doing anything where you're spraying tissue, leaf tissue, add a spreader sticker. In. Just, it's, just add it in to make sure you have it. So now that we're mixed, we'll actually get into spring. So the goal is always to get the product where the pest or the pathogen is. Um, so you have to know a little bit about the pest or the pathogen. Um, I bring up specifically um, some of the scale insects. They feed on the inner parts of the canopy on the bottom or on the undersides of leaves. So you may need to get in next to the trunk and spray kind of up above you and inside to really get and coat those undersides of leaves or of the leaves and the woody plant parts to make sure that you're getting even and complete coverage. Because if you're with most of these, these uh, insecticides and fungicides, if you're not actually touching where the insect or the disease is, you're not gonna get control. So getting coverage is, is absolutely imperative. So when we're doing spray coverage, um, look at what maybe it could limit coverage. Maybe you have part of the tree or the, the shrub that's against a building. So you have to be very mindful of how close you're getting to it. Or maybe there's just a part of the tree that it's hanging over a neighbor's house and they won't let you spray over there. So just make sure that you're getting good coverage to what you can. And if you aren't going to be able to get coverage um, due to those limitations, be sure that is communicated beforehand. And in here, you can see the two plants, on, the treated on the left and on the right, the technician, they didn't get quite close enough on the window side, um, on the photo on the left. They just were a little maybe leery of getting it on the windows or the siding. So this is a growth regulator and you can see the escapes and the additional growth that's out there on the left side by the window. And then the second part is, is the plant at the proper stage to be sprayed? And is the application relevant to the targeted pest? So I took these photos, um, gosh, two years ago already, um, almost two years ago, to kind of pr provide the point of how quickly or how long things can develop. So on 4-7, and this was in downtown Minneapolis, so it is a little bit of a heat island effect, but you can see the leaves started to emerge. They started to kind of break out of that bud and break open. But then it kind of stopped. We had a, a bit of cold weather. So for almost 14, a little over 14 days, we had very little leaf development in those 14 days. But I would definitely be looking at getting that foliar spray on right kind of at some point in the, between the 7th and that 23rd. And then you can see over the period of six days, we had a lot of warm weather from the 23rd to the 29th. And I know there, there are two different species of, of apple, uh, crab apples, but these trees are right next to each other. The leaf development was, was extraordinary over those two days. And I make the point of make sure the plant is in the stage that needs to be on there. Um, if you go too early, 
with some of these, maybe, ah, you know, I, I started my route on, you know, this part of the city and I came to this property and it's not quite ready to be sprayed. You spray it, you're not going to have coverage early enough. Because if you spray it too early, it's not going to get coated onto the leaf tissue and it's not going to actually provide any value. So then that early, it's basically unprotected early into the, into the, where the infections are most likely to occur. So you're going to have poor performance. Here's another example. Um, so after 30 days, you can see the development of the here. And it's really, if you're missing kind of the, the, the leaf stage or the, the insect stage, and you're not scouting or keeping track of growing degree days, that's where you just start kind of willy-nilly. It fits into the, the cycle. Here we go. Um, this would be a great example, and I believe this was a tent caterpillar. And you can kind of see on the right, I think it's a tent up there. I don't I, if my memory is correct. But maybe instead of doing a foliar spray, we could have looked at doing a Lepitec, uh trunk or soil injection prior to its development so that we didn't have to worry about coming back for a foliar spray and timing it when those, those, uh, those instars are small. Finally, when we're looking at foliar sprays, <clears throat> foliar sprays is a lot of attention to detail. So certainly when wind speeds are above 10, 10 miles per hour, um, definitely doing big tree spraying is just not gonna be feasible or workable. Follow your local guidance. Um, you know, certainly if you're on the coast you know, or by large bodies of water where you're gonna have more wind, you may have to schedule those jobs and kind of work your way from the water inland start early in the morning, get those done so that you have less wind and then work your way inland. Um, and make sure you're following your best judgment as well. Um, a question I just saw here was a, a difference between a soil injection and a soil drench. Great question. Um, and it pertains really to um, Lepitect in particular. Lepitect has a label that only allows for soil injection. Um, and that means that you're inserting it either with a soil care probe or an HTI below the surface of the soil without excavating. That's the big difference. <clears throat> and that is an EPA regulatory change, but certainly a uh, 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 demand, whereas something like Zytec or TransTech, you can do a soil drench or a soil injection and achieve the same result. And make sure you know the direction of the prevailing wind. Um, so this is coming from the right to the left. So you can see how this technician is working the spray into the tree. You know, and you want to make sure that you're not coating yourself in the spray. And we'll go through a quick little technique on that as well. But make sure you're paying attention to the weather. Um, it's, it's probably no surprise for everyone, but every, in the spring, everyone's a weather hawk and a weather expert, if you will, in the, in the spray industry. So here is a, a, I pulled the weather for Minneapolis and this was in the spring of last year, I pulled this. So you can kind of see, yeah, we got uh, early in the morning, no chance of precipitation, looks good, even though it's partly cloudy, but we do have some concerns around wind. Now, I don't typically make my, my, my decisions on should I spray today or not based solely on what I see on a weather report, because this is gonna be probably based on one place. It doesn't take into a microclimate effect. So you might have some parts of your city or your service region that it's maybe five miles per hour or the gusts may get up to 17, but you can work within that. And then make sure you add in a spreader sticker. But if we're looking at Lexington, Kentucky here, so we've got early morning showers, but then as it uh, goes through the day, maybe I'd start looking at coming to the shop at, mm, Maybe 9 a.m., 8 a.m., getting started when the, the chance of precipitation or once that cloud cover and those showers move through. But I wouldn't try to get out and, and do it beforehand. And a little rule is, or general guidance is, you want to have about an hour for most pesticide applications uh, in between rainfall. Um, so kind of keep an eye on the weather. There's some great apps out there that'll give you a pretty good idea of what weather is coming in from a radar perspective to make your own judgment. And then make sure you're selecting the spray gun to fit the spray. <clears throat> um, I picked these four, they're probably the four most common spray tools that we have out in the field. A backpack sprayer, um, they can get to 100 PSI max. Um, that's, gonna that's gonna be a lot of hand pumping for you. 
But look at the flow rate, very low. You're not gonna be able to get a lot of product out there. Um, it does have a variable tip. So this would be something for doing some small, maybe shrub sprays, some spot sprays, a lot of herbicide sprays. And then the JD9 spray gun. You can certainly put a lot of PSI through it, but also it doesn't allow a lot of product to go through. Those apertures and those orifices are rather small. So you're not gonna be able to get a whole lot of height out of this, but this is perfect for small trees or shrubs. And it has a nice, easy to work with variable tip to go from a stream to a fan to a cone. Then the turbine tree spray gun, um, both again, it has a 3.5 gallons per minute up to 27. Now these are nice for medium sized trees, um, but what I think you wanna fit what you're gonna be doing. If you're doing primarily shrubs, it's a bit bigger of a spray gun. It's a little harder to adjust or get that kind of, that spray pattern to what you want because it'll also affect the spray droplets. Um, if you're getting a mist, you're gonna have more drip. Um, if you're getting a larger droplet size, it's gonna be fatter. It's gonna move, it's gonna, you're not gonna have nearly as much drift, but you'll be able to create a larger spray column. Then we got the old John Bean gun, the FMC, <clears throat> the big heavy boy. These are really nice for doing large tree sprays um, where you're going through a lot of product. Um, you're spraying high up into the air. You're trying to get the very tippy top of that oak tree or that elm tree, but it's not great for doing smaller sprays. You know, If you're trying to adjust this to do maybe um, apple trees or something like that. It's just not really designed to get as effectively up close. So have those options available. And when you're building out your spray route, look at what am I primarily going to be spraying today and fit that tool to it. Because if you're using, trying to stretch your JD9 gun, oh, I'm trying to get to the top or get to the lower part of that oak tree. It's just not going to build enough of a column to really give you a good spray pattern. So really fit the tool with what you're trying to, to spray for. And then certainly with spray droplet size um, and how it kind of moves within the plants. Um, I've seen the spray blowers, whether it's the Echoes, the Stills, the Husqvarna's, or this, this one I just saw in uh, Home Depot. I've seen these more and more, especially for shrub sprays uh, because people are doing mosquitoes and things like that. These are great for getting really good coverage on smaller plant material. Um, but you do need to be close into it. And what I like about these for some of these, like maybe boxwoods or some of those plants where they're very dense and the foliage is resistant to movement. You know, it does, it requires the plant to be moving from the air. This can give you a really nice coverage, but you're definitely not going to be able to spray, you know, much of, if anything, above your chest level. Whereas with a JD9, it's got a little bit more push. You know, it's going to be able to move that viburnum hedge or the the leaf tissue around to really give you that complete coverage. So again, fit the droplet size to what you're trying to create and how high or far away you need to be. And then the second part to that is <clears throat> know your pump and your, your hose. Um, is my pump gonna be able to put out enough pressure and do I have enough hose with a lot, enough inner diameter to move enough product for that John Bean spray gun to actually get up to the top of a tree? If you have three eighths inch inner diameter um, hose with a John Bean spray gun, you're probably not gonna be able to get enough product to actually move through that or at a pressure high enough that you're gonna be able to build a spray column to get to the top of the tree. You can find these, um, especially look for your, your spray pump manufacturer and who you're buying your hoses from. They'll be able to provide you this kind of charts with in flow rate, how much PSI are you losing per 100 feet of hose? Now you've got to make sure that you have enough spray or the pump pressure at the pump. If you've got 300 feet of hose, you're going to lose a lot of pressure just from the friction of it moving through that, that, that um, hose material. Finally, some spray technique, um, be consistent. Um, spraying is, it's, you want to be even using your full body. And I like these, these, these uh, diagrams because it shows kind of start at the top, work your way back down and work it back up and really move slowly to give you full coverage. Um, and then as you're working your way down, make sure you're using a consistent pattern. Um, I, I want to make when you're training a technician, start with water and you want to see them starting a tree at the same kind of angle. Maybe they're breaking it into cardinal directions, get the first quarter, the second quarter, 
and then next and kind of all the way down so that you're getting that even and complete coverage. Make sure they're not moving too slowly or too fast. Um, and focus on, especially with large trees, focus on building your spray column. Slow is good. Um, you don't want to have a lot of, you know, just quick hand movements or wrist movements with a large spray gun. You want to have that spray column building upon itself so that you can get it up to the top because it does build upon the spray that's, you know, kind of below it um, and avoid drifting it into the target, um, you know, standing kind of a little farther away and I'm going to try to drift it into the top of the tree. Um, you're probably just going to be wasting a lot more product. Um, you want to build that spray column to get that in there and then work into the direction of the wind. Let the wind, if there is a little bit of a breeze, help you and be aware of that shifting wind as you're working because you don't want to walk into your spray drift. If you're spraying smaller trees, um, and I like this, di this, this image here. So the technician has their back to the building. Um, so they're spraying away from the building versus spraying towards it. So they're not going to get any product off target. Um, but you're spraying away from it. And then also they're going to move. You can see where that red line, um, where they would walk in that path, you know, not stepping into that tree well. But they're going to be moving consistently from the top to the bottom and then back to the top as they're spraying and moving away from it to make sure that they're getting that spray column. And you can see as that spray, that column, it's not perfect. It's not like a, a dot at the top. It does have spray that is the, as the product moves off of it, you're getting coverage onto the tree and from the top all the way to the bottom. So make sure you adjust your spray pattern. And as you get closer, you don't need a column for those lower, those lower sections of the tree. Maybe you move to more of a cone tip or you, turn, you have the pressure turned down a little bit. So adjust it to how close you are away from your target. When you're spraying shrubs below your waist or things below your waist, reduce the pressure from the pump. Um, this technician, they, I don't recall exactly how much hose they have, but they're probably running the pump at about 90 PSI. The more pressure you have, the more that, that there's, there's the droplets bouncing. They're gonna bounce off. You're gonna get more material non-target. Um, you're going to have it bouncing off into the windows, the siding. So adjust your spray or your PSI down. Use a fan or a cone spray to give you a consistent spray pattern. And think of it as you're spray painting a car or a wall. It's even consistent motions. You're using your whole arm to really give you that spray pattern. I don't like this rapid moving of the wrist to kind of just sort of waft it on there. You want to see slow, consistent, deliberate movement and then walk at a slow and consistent pace. And here, I like this as well. You can kind of see that spray pattern as they're spraying onto the tissue. They're about 18 to 24 inches away. They're giving that nice coverage. You can see there isn't a whole lot of, of material or any bouncing off onto the building to put in the product exactly where they want to have it. And then how much to spray? Um, these are just some general kind of how much it makes sense, you know, from in because a one inch crab tree, crab apple, it's fairly small, small canopy, about a half a gallon, a five inch crab apple, two to four. Crab apple is a little hard to use DBH because certainly older ones, the diameter may not be that big, but the canopy is huge or the, the diameter is big, but they've pruned it back so much that it's a smaller tree. But kind of use these to give you some idea of how much product you should be going through. And this is great to use for a new technician. You know, start with water, see how much they're actually going through. How many jobs and trees did they spray? How much product did they use? And then spray to leaf wetness. Um, some products will, uh, will uh, indicate, you know, spray to drip. Some will spray to leaf. Read the label. Um, I use the adage of once you're wet, you can't get any wetter. It just wastes time, wastes product. You're unlikely to have better performance. And there's a much higher risk of non-target effects. Maybe you're spraying out of the, under the turf. Because some products, um, if they are overapplied, like propiconazole, it can cause, um, and Microtect as well, it can cause um, the leaves because it does have some growth regulator effect. It can cause that. So just be aware of that when you're working. And this is a nice uh, couple of photos of, this is with Trimtech, which is our shrub growth regulator. You can see this is a spray to drip. You can see that the product and these are kind of on these cupped materials. You can see it's evenly coated the whole plant. It kind of pools a little bit right at that, that leaf tip. That's good coverage. Um, you don't want to have it 
raining off of it on anything. It's just a spray to drip, which is even and consistent coverage. So a couple of drills as we're finishing off here, um, test your employees or test your team as you're working. Um, say I want, you know, you can kind of figure out based on the, the surface area, how much spray you want to have them put out and then put that into the tank and walk it out. Make sure that they're getting, if you want to be putting out 10 feet or 10 gallons into a hundred feet of shrub height, have 10 gallons in the tank and spray it out. Are they getting that amount of coverage? If they're short, you're putting out too much, or maybe they have five gallons left in the tank. They're not getting it coated. They're not getting good enough coverage. So do those little drills and you'll get a good sense of how much product and how much your cadence and your pacing should work. And then this is just a fun one. Um, if you have a throw line, um, hang some hula hoops up into the tree, maybe one at the top and a couple of harder to get places and start trying to spray into those hula hoops. See if you can get the spray pattern to get go through those hula hoops. Um, it's important for technicians to practice building that spray column um, so they can also see how much does product really drift. Um, it's a nice way for them to, to really get that you don't wanna be kind of waving that spray gun around. You want it to build the column upon itself. And then I like to put, um, if you want areas that you don't want them to get you know, drift on, take a piece of newspaper and put it on like just one or two sheets, put it on the ground, or maybe on some shrubs or on part of the house so that it sticks there. And if they get spray pattern onto there, you'll know that they oversprayed or they got too much drift because it'll, it'll show. So it's just some nice, easy drills that you can do to kind of get a sense of where things are at. So in kind of summary, focus on reducing your total number of sprays. Um, look at protocols that maybe you can use do a soil application or do it beforehand before they're active or maybe a longer material. So ensure you're using the ideal materials, control what you can control. Um, so mix properly, use the right product, um, reduce the number of sprays that you do, and then practice, 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 utilizing spray, proper spraying technique. So I'll answer any questions and I, I see that we're a little short on time